Hi again. In our next two programs, we're going to take a look at how the electromagnetic spectrum interacts with various forms of matter. Let's start where with something we can recall. Visible light. Visible light, we can recall, can be produced when electrons move from one orbit to the other. You might recall back in an earlier study of the hydrogen atom that we have various energy levels that our electron can exist at. And we might recall that when an electron in the third orbit transitions to the second orbit, we get a red color of light. So colors of light can be produced as electrons transition or move from one orbit to another. What if we subject our substance to x-rays? Well, in the case of an x-ray, it has so much energy, we can take an electron from the first orbit and essentially take it out to the infinite orbit and create an ion. So these first groups of radiation, visible, UV, and x-rays, all deal with electron transitions of different magnitude. Now, what happens if we submit infrared radiation on a substance? Well, it turns out that infrared radiation lacks the energy to cause the electron to really move much from one orbit to another. The majority of infrared radiation causes increased vibrational motion of bonds. And this is the basis of infrared spectroscopy. We'll take a little bit more close look at those bonds momentarily. What happens when we shine microwaves on a substance? Well, you might be familiar with a microwave oven. Essentially, the microwave oven focuses on the behavior or movement of water molecules. So if we shine microwaves on a uh, particular water molecule at the appropriate energy level, we can cause that water molecule to rotate more quickly. So microwaves increase the rotation of molecules. And finally, what happens when we use, say, radio waves, and we shine radio waves at a material? Well, for this, I'm going to focus in on the proton for a moment. A proton can be thought of as a small particle that's spinning. When we subject it to radio waves, we can actually cause that proton to change the direction of its spin. And that's the basis of NMR, our final type of spectra that we'll look at in our next program. But anyway, let's get back to this vibration of bonds. In order for a material to be detectable by infrared spectroscopy, it must possess the following properties. So recall these two. To be IR detectable. So in order for us to see a bond using infrared spectroscopy, the bond must be polar. Now, I'm emphasizing here the bond has to be polar, not the molecule. And the second criteria is the dipoles must move. So let's consider a couple of examples here. Suppose we have oxygen connected to oxygen in a double bond. I'm going to represent that bond with a spring. Because, and the molecule is vibrating out and then back in. Because this bond isn't a polar bond, this vibration would not be detectable in infrared spectroscopy. We wouldn't see any absorption. If, on the other hand, we have a bond, say, with carbon double bonded to oxygen, so a carbon-oxygen bond, in that situation, the carbon will tend to lose its electrons and develop a slightly positive charge, and the oxygen a slightly negative charge. When this starts to vibrate out and then in turn back in, 
we would see these dipoles move. They would move out and in. And as a result, this type of bond would be infrared detectable. So bonds must be polar and they must vibrate in such a manner that their dipoles move to be detectable. So let's look a little bit more closely now at how this technique works. We begin with a source of infrared radiation. So over here, this is my IR source. And it sends in a wide range of different energy levels of infrared radiation. Infrared radiation isn't just one level, it's a whole bunch of levels of radiation. And so that light then goes into our sample, which is located here. That sample, because it has infrared detectable bonds in it, some of these bonds that are present in our molecule will absorb or remove certain energies in our infrared light. So these are energies that are absorbed by our bonds. Those appear as big valleys in the spectrum. So here, this big valley, say, right here, or the big valley we happen to have over here, these represent energies absorbed in my molecule. So if I look here at this molecule, which is ethanoic acid, I can see I have a carbon-oxygen bond, carbon double bonded oxygen bond. And as this bond starts to vibrate in and out, it lists down here in your IB data booklet that the carbon-oxygen double bond that's found in aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids should cause absorption in this range. So this one is usually somewhere around 1700 to 1750 centimeters to the minus one. And so that corresponds to this valley we see right here. So this vibration is removing this type of energy. If we have a carbon oxygen hydrogen bond that's present in carboxylic acids, be careful not to confuse it with the one that's in alcohols, but in carboxylic acids we should expect a very broad peak from 2500, which is roughly here on our scale, down to about 3000. So we, we tend to have that one as well present. Now, we also have carbon carbon single bonds and carbon hydrogen bonds, but so do most other organic molecules. So when I see here the CH bond in alkanes, alkenes and arenes, that really doesn't help me too much because that's in all organic molecules. So the bond up here, um, due to the 1700 and this bond then, is somewhere around 3000 to the 2500 mark. So the infrared spectrum can be used to identify perhaps the functional groups or bonding arrangement. Now a word about this lower range. Um, down here at about 1500 and less. This is called the fingerprint region. And much like our own fingerprints, this is very unique to every substance. So often a library is kept of this fingerprint region which can be used to identify various molecules. Now a little word about the scale that's on the bottom, wave number, um, what this represents. Let's take a look here at what that number represents. 3,000 centimeters to the minus one. This equals the number of waves that are present in one centimeter. So visually, if you think of a gap that's one centimeter wide, so let's say our gap is one centimeter wide, what they're saying is present in this one centimeter gap, you would be able to fit 3,000 waves. Now, I haven't got that many in there, but there are 3,000 waves that fit in there. That means that the wavelength of this infrared radiation I could determine by going one centimeter divided by 3,000. 
So the wavelengths would be like 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, which would be the same as 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, times, now centa is 10 to the minus 2 meters. And I could put that all together. And that would be the same as 10 to the minus 6 meters. So this represents a certain wavelength. These numbers represent certain wavelengths of light. And generally speaking, as we move out in this direction, the wavelength is getting larger. Wavelength is going up because I can fit fewer and fewer waves into a centimeter. You might recall from our knowledge of the electromagnetic spectrum that if the wavelength goes up, that means that the energy is going down. So as we move further and further to the right, we're getting longer waves with less and less infrared radiation. Anyway, that's the end of our program on infrared spectroscopy. In our next one, we'll take a look at nuclear magnetic resonance. Thanks for watching.